night that we can sing your praises. And God, uh, I um, know you're pleased with uh, stuff that's done uh, for you in your name. And I pray you be with us tonight as we come to you and look at your word. Uh, God, uh, thank you for uh, the blessings you've allowed us to uh, be a part of today. And God, I pray that uh, as we go from this place tonight, we'll take with us something that uh, we find that we need this week. Because uh, uh, i got the world, the flesh, and the devil is all the time uh, trying to get us to do things we don't, shouldn't do, shouldn't ought to do, and really don't want to do, but sometimes we do them anyway. And Lord, so I pray you just help us, God. And uh, be with us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hymn number 361 in the red hymnal. Let's read our prayer. It says, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are the Jesus Christ. But ye know the proof of him that as a son with the Father, uh, he hath served with me in the gospel. Him, therefore, I hope to send presently, so soon as I shall see how it will go with me. But I trust in the Lord that I also, myself, shall come shortly. Heavenly Father, help us now 
as we study about this good man's example. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, in case you want to know, 1 Timothy 1 2 uh, shows us that Timotheus, or Timothy, was one of Paul's converts. It says, Under Timothy, my own son, in the faith. So it definitely says here in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2, that Timothy was a convert of the Apostle Paul. Now, uh, and, and you can go to the book of Acts, and the last time I preached this, I went into all that. And, and we're going to, uh, since I've covered that before in other sermons, uh, we're just going to pass that by and let you look that up on your own. But I want to look at three things that Timothy was a good example in. And uh, he was a good example even to Paul. Uh, I remember before Brother Bill died that uh, he was up in the hospital and uh, I was there in the room and, and uh, Linda went out and uh, the other people that were there, the nurse, and I was just sitting by his bed and he took me by the hand and he said, he said, boy, he said, uh, you've been a good testimony to me. And I started squalling. Because, you know, Brother Bill had always been uh, the fellow that I tried to help and the leader uh, around here. And, 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 you know, I helped him and helped him and helped him. And, and to realize that, that he looked at me as an example of something, uh, I, you know, that was something to me. I just, and I'm sure Timothy felt the same way. Uh, I mean, Paul wrote, <laughs> uh, uh, half the New Testament is written by Apostle Paul or one of his converts, like Luke. I mean, you take Luke and the Pauline epistles and add the book of Hebrews into that and you've got, you've got a big chunk of the New Testament that's, that's all uh, because of this one man, Paul. And, and to say that uh, this, this young man, uh, you know, was, was good enough in Paul's eyes to send as his personal representative. Now, there's three reasons why Paul did this. First of all, he was Paul's communicator. Now, I'm not talking about that little thing on Star Trek that, you know, popped out like that to Kirk. I'm not talking about that. <laughs> or the little thing they had on the new show where they, they, they hit their chest and the little, little button uh, talk to people. Uh, but it actually, it's the, sort of the same idea. Um, Paul wanted to talk to people. And in this case, Paul was in the Huskow. He couldn't go nowhere. He was chained to a Roman soldier uh, down in some Roman jail somewhere in Rome. And even if he wanted to, uh, he couldn't go nowhere. So if Paul wanted to talk to somebody, he, he wrote them a letter. But back in those days, there was no U.S. Postal Service. Uh, and the, the only way to get a letter to somebody was to say, Hey, Timothy, here's a letter. Take it to Philippians. Give it to them and read it to them. When you get there, tell them I said howdy and I love them. And, you know, that's what, what happened. And so some guy would, you know, he would take it, uh, he would walk down the road probably because you couldn't afford to, 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 to get a chariot, hire your chariot. And once you got to the seaport, uh, you'd uh, uh, get the money together to get on a ship. And then you would go to uh, the nearest port where that ship was going uh, to where you were supposed to deliver that letter. And then you'd get back on the road and you'd hike, you know, you'd spend a couple days hiking to wherever you was going to. And then you'd finally, you know, knock on the preacher's door or the deacon's door and say, I'm here, Paul sent me, here's the letter. Uh, and it, it, sometimes it took weeks and months and uh, there's even been cases where it took years to get a letter from one point A to point B. So it was pretty nice that Paul had somebody that he could use as a communicator. And Timothy uh, did that job for Paul. Um, Paul wanted to keep in touch with the churches. Now, put yourself in Paul's place. Um, and, and if you want to see a modern example of this, talk to somebody like Brother Demopolis, okay? Brother Demopolis has started four or five churches over in the Ukraine, and he can't be over there right now. So, uh, now, 
we've got the internet and uh, email and different things and what what is it zoom that you have these little video conferences on mm -hmm. and so uh he does all that and he he but he wants to stay in touch with those people over there because it's important to him he's won these people to christ he's helped them start a church he's gotten a building he's taught their kids he's buried their grandpas you know uh and he's very close they're like family to him and so he wants to stay in touch with them so this is the way paul felt about his churches that he started so he wanted to keep in touch well i just explained how things work back in the roman postal department uh galatians 6 verse 6 um said let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things now this particular verse has two meanings. The word communicate here in Galatians 6 talks about giving to someone something monetary in uh, remuneration for their teaching. This is why you're supposed to pay the pastor of the church. He's the one that gets up, he studies to show himself approved if he's any kind of a preacher, and he gets up, uh, you know, three times on Sunday and once on Wednesday and sometimes uh, other services and he'll get up and he'll give you the word of God or teach you something from the word of God and you pay him and that's what God expects of you. But it also can mean just to find out how you are. Um, you notice everybody was talking about Uncle Charlie's car tonight. What happened with his tire? How, how is Uncle Charlie? Because we love Uncle Charlie. He's a part of our congregation. And if one of you got sick, we would we would want to know how you were. Um, I have some relatives up in Tennessee, like I said this morning. I can't get in touch with them. And they were very near where all that hurricane stuff came through. And I'm a little worried about them. I will be so glad I found out that you can call an 800 number for the Red Cross, and they will send somebody to somebody's house to see how they are. And I'm going to do that if I can't get a hold of uh, my Uncle John and, and Aunt Gail within the next couple of days. I'm going to call the Red Cross and say, can you please go up to uh, Flag Pond and knock on uh, John Denton's door and see how he is. Um, but, you know, that's because I love my Uncle John and Aunt Gail and I, I want to know how they are. I'm, I'm a little worried about them. Um, now, Uncle John is my uh, daddy's younger brother but he's still a lot older than I am the guy's in his late 80s you know so I don't know what you you know it's, it's bad enough to face this when you're young but when you're in your 80s and you got you know tornadoes and hurricanes and stuff coming to your house you know that that uh, that's something um, and, and family you want to know how they are. And Paul, he considered all these people family. He wanted to know how they were doing. So he was going to send Timothy. I don't know what he said to Timothy. I imagine the conversation like, now when you get there, find out how Joe is, because, you know, Joe's been having trouble with his arthritis, and, and, and then there's there's Maybell, and, 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 you know, she's got this uh, a lung tick problem, and, uh, and find out how she, and then there's little Johnny, he's probably not little anymore, but find out how Johnny is, make sure he's behaving himself. You know, I could just hear conversations like that. Back in the days before they had mass communication. He wanted to know how they were and how the people were. And Timothy, in his work for the Apostle Paul, he showed that he was willing to sacrifice for the work of the Lord. That's the kind of person that I like to see in God's service. And now when you say God's service, people think, oh, that's just the preacher ministry or the missionary. No. Everything you do, you can do in the name of Jesus Christ and you can do for God. You did a work for God today. But you know it or not, brother. You did and when you get to heaven, you're going to get a reward for it. And Timothy was all the time probably doing stuff. I mean, 
Paul was stuck in the who's cow. We don't understand this about the Roman prison system. The Roman prison system, there was no system. When they locked you up in the dungeon, they did not feed you. If you did not have someone on the outside to bring you food every day, you starved to death. Well, you know what? I can guess he was bringing him food every day. His name was Timothy. And he was bringing him what he could gather together. He probably had the believers at Rome going out scouring the markets and, and, and taking stuff out of their own larders and, and cooking it up for Paul and bringing him out something to eat every day. And so he knew that when he sent Timothy, that Timothy was going to get the job done because Timothy would do the over and above the call of duty to get the job done. So how do you know that? Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 16. Uh, he, told, he told the Hebrews, he said, But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Since Timothy was a communicator and he was going to sacrifice his time and effort and energy to go to the Philippian church, Paul knew that he not only loved Paul, but he loved the folks at Philippi. I bet they were glad to see him. Uh, and Timothy was a good young man. He lived a good, righteous a life. He was a good witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you don't want to send a scoundrel in the name of the Lord. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is Skezzy Pete. I'm going to send him up here to <laughs> tell you something. No, no. no that, you know, this is uh, reprehensible Herbert. You know, I'm going to send him up. No, no, no. I'm going to send this good, clean cut kid to tell you a message from the Lord. Ephesians. Uh, chapter 4, uh, 29 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Well, I imagine he taught that lesson to uh, Timothy quite, quite early on in Timothy's ministry, that if he was going to be effective for the Lord, he had to, uh, he had to live a clean life. Uh, Fellow named Pastor Charles Curtis uh, said told this story about uh, real communication. Uh, he was, he's quoting this woman here. He says, "My husband does not talk to me." Is the complaint of 90 percent of American wives, including some of the people in my church. Uh, it has been claimed that 100 percent of the people seeking professional help in their marriage have problems in communication. Uh, in our world, the power to send and receive messages reaches around the globe and out even to space. That's true. And this information is available in seconds. Yet husbands and wives are unable to successfully communicate across the breakfast table. Yeah, kind of weird, ain't it? Uh, please talk to me is the request and basic need of many houses. Communication is the richest source of blessing. What a joy it is to talk and listen. Recently, I had a sore throat and was to preach that night. And in order to save my throat, I wrote notes and did not speak for the entire day. It was maddening and frustrating. Uh, a word spoken in season, how good it is, says Proverbs 15:23. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and settings of silver. Uh, the lack of communication multiplies our problems as it destroys bridges over which we need to travel. An old farmer had trouble guiding his mule one day, but said nothing. When asked why he did not speak to the mule, he replied, That old mule kicked me five years ago, and I haven't spoke to him since. <laughs> no, that's not the way it's supposed to work. Uh, a marriage is offered companionship and is it impossible without communication. People can be lonely in a crowd or in a marriage. Lines of communication should be carefully built and maintained in the home. People are lonely because they build walls instead of bridges. Uh, Joseph Newton said that. Communication is more than just speaking. 
How well do we listen? The scripture admonishes us, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let, uh, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Uh, while a senator, Lyndon Baines Johnson, had this sign in his office, You ain't learning nothing when you're doing all the talking. Amen, brother. That's a good saying. Uh, listen, uh, listening is especially essential to communication. Parents often fail to really hear what their children are trying to say to them. Teenagers run away from home because it's the only way they know how to cope with a family that has forgotten how to listen. Listening has a way of saying to me, you are an important person. I appreciate you. I accept you. I love you. I want to hear what you have to say. Well, that's a good saying. I, I don't know who this Pastor Curtis is, but yeah, I think he had a handle on communicating. Paul wanted to communicate, and he wanted Timothy to be his communicator. Secondly, he says right here in the scriptures that Timothy was a caring preacher. He was a caring preacher. Woe be unto the church that has a preacher that doesn't care about them. And I've met people like that. You know what I've seen though? They don't last long. You see these churches that, you know, go through a pastor every couple, three years, they got a new pastor. There's churches like that. Um, there's lots of reasons for that, but one of the main reasons is somebody in that relationship is not listening. And usually it's the pastor that comes along. He thinks he knows everything and doesn't have to listen to the people that are there. Look, the people that are in a church know the problems of the church just about as well as the pastor does. And if you're a new preacher coming into a church, you better listen to what people are telling you or you're going to screw up. And I've, I've, seen, I've seen pastors do it. Now, I had a great advantage I was here for 30 some years before I became the pastor as your assistant and the children's church guy and the Sunday school guy. So I, I knew about as good as anybody else, but not every preacher that comes into a pulpit has that advantage. I, I, I praise God for what I just told you because that's given me a, a great leg up. <laughs> and believe me, I needed it. Um, he was a caring pastor. He cared for Paul's burden, and he helped Paul. So, one, number one on Timothy's I care about you list was Paul. And frankly, Paul needed a little caring for. Um, how do I say this kindly to Brother Paul? When I get to heaven, I'll probably say, you didn't take care of yourself very good, bud. And he didn't. I mean, he gets stoned in a city and he's laying there maybe dead and God brings him back to life or maybe he's just unconscious and he finally comes back to life and what does he do? He gets up and goes right back into town. <laughs> Look, when they're gunning for you in town, any, most people wouldn't go back into town. They, they'd run away for the next town. But now Paul, he'd go and say, Hi, I'm back. And of course, that was the exact right thing to do because God kind of shook him up. Probably the first guy says, I thought you were dead. Now, while I was, I come back. Here, I want to preach to you again. Okay, you preach to me. Anything you say. You know. <laughs> Had a great advantage there. I, I, I'm not sure I want that advantage. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11 28. Uh, besides those things that are without, uh, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Uh, Paul says here in 2 Corinthians that he, he was burdened down with the care of the churches. Not, he's not saying he minded. He's just pointing out to the Corinthians that their problems were his problems. And he worked hard at keeping in touch with the churches for one thing, so he knew what to pray about and what to kind of worry about and, and you know, ask the Lord to help him with. Um, 
we should have a good enough fellowship around here. Now, I, I appreciate the fact that some folks, you know, they don't want to burden everybody with their problems, and that's a great and wonderful thing. But if you have a true, genuine need you need folks to pray about, don't don't hesitate to tell folks you need prayer. And, and if you need some help, ask for some help. Um, if you don't, uh, you may not get any. Uh, we, we love each other around here. And uh, I've seen this over and over again. We will help one another. And Paul... His greatest desire was to help these churches. You got to remember, the Roman Empire was a pagan empire. They didn't worship Jesus Christ. They worshiped the pantheon of gods, Apollo and Aphrodite and all these little Greek, Greek gods with statues. And they went to the temples and they sacrificed goats just like they did down at the temple of Jerusalem. But it wasn't to the Jehovah God, it was to some statue. Somehow or another. And they gave lots of money thinking that, okay, if I give lots of money, you know, uh, people do that in church nowadays. They go to, uh, you know, these big denominational churches and they go, well, if I give lots of money in the offering plate, uh, God will surely help me out in this and that or the other thing. No, that's not the way God works. You get down on your knees, you get saved, first of all. Then after you get saved, you're a child of God. Then you can go to God and say, uh, Daddy, I need some help. And you're his child and he'll help you. That's how it works. So Paul, Paul had all his care. And Timothy was there to kind of prop Paul up. One of the things I'm praying for is God give me a helper. Back in my prayer letter, I put it up the other day. You'll see... God, I'm praying uh, that God will send me a, a helper for the ministry down yonder. I need someone to pass that on to. I don't want to let that die. It does too much good work. If you don't believe how much good work it does, go ask the people of Ukraine after they get all those 30,000 tracks I printed for them. All those booklets I made from Brother Demopolis. People care about that stuff. They really do. Uh, the reason you need to be a caring Christian is that people are looking for people that care. Um, you really need to care about folks. Uh, even policemen on the street. Now, a lot of times, you know, I wouldn't want to be a policeman. I really wouldn't. Um, they stop people, and, uh, you know, a lot of times they pull them over. And they, they get it, they've been weaving on around the road or they ran the stop sign or whatever, or they, they're, they're kind of driving erratically and they pull them over and, yeah, they've been tipping the bottle. And so they have to deal with a drunk guy. Um, sometimes the people they pull over, they're dangerous people. They have a record, they have a warrant, you know. But, uh, the dealings that I've had with policemen have been, uh, policemen can be nice people. And it's nice to run across somebody like that. Uh, last time somebody pulled me over, I had a tail light that was out. And uh, I said, well, I didn't know it was out. And uh, he said, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's the right one over here. Uh, I said, is the, the blinker, the turn signal off, or is it just a brake? He said, just a brake light. I said, okay, well, I know which bulb to buy now. And he kind of laughed. And he said, do you need uh, uh, help uh, going on? And I said, no, I'm just a block from home. If you want to follow me around to the house, make sure I get there okay. And he did. He followed me to the house and made sure and he rolled the window down and said, you have a good night and you stay safe and you get that bulb in the morning. And I did. It's morning on the way to work. I went a little early and I tried all the parts and got me, that shows you how long ago it was, and I got me a bulb and fixed my tail light. And I appreciate the fact that the guy was nice. He could have been belligerent. I lived over there off of uh, uh, Kirk Street over there in Brownsville. You know, that was a... You talk about a ghetto, brother. Now, that's a ghetto. <laughs> um, I, I, but the fellow was nice to me. He saw that, uh, you know, I was a preacher and, and uh, you know, I was coming home. Um, I told him that I had been... Uh, I think I'd been down to the rescue mission, actually. 
and Linda couldn't go with me that time, and I was coming back, so I was dressed up in a tie and a shirt, you know, and uh, I guess he was a little surprised to find somebody like that running around Brownville that time of night. Uh, but people look for someone that cares. Uh, it's terrible to go to the hospital and find and have a nurse that's kind of grumpy and nasty, isn't it? I see that and I say, oh, you know, that shouldn't be. Uh, a couple times, you know, I've, I've gotten the nurse out in the hallway and said, what's eating you, lady? <laughs> I said that to one. She said, what do you mean? I said, well, you were kind of nasty to so-and-so in there. She says, was I? And she told me her problems. And I said, well, I said, I'm a pastor. I have to leave my problems at the door when I get in the pulpit. You have to leave your problems when you come into the hospital. She said, yeah, I know you're right. I said, well, do it. She said, thank you. And she thanked me. We had a word of prayer. And I talked to him when he got out of the hospital, that fellow, and said, I don't know what you said to that nurse, but she was awful nice to me. <laughs> After you took her out in the hallway, she was just pleasant as pie. Well, I guess it works every now and then. Psalm 142, verse 4 says, I looked on my right hand and beheld there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. Oh, what a pitiful state to be in. That no man cares for your soul. A scientist once conducted an experiment in his laboratory. From the ceiling he suspended an iron ball weighing a ton. I don't know what in the world he suspended it with, but that must have been some, some cord. Um, he attached it to a cable strong enough to sustain its weight. Besides the huge iron ball, he hung a small sphere made of cork and attached it to a thread fastened to the ceiling. An electrical mechanism kept the little cork bottle swinging round and round slowly, uh, kind of almost like a pendulum, except it went round and round, and it would hit the iron ball every time it came around to where the iron ball was. At length, after days of unceasing swinging uh, round and round and back and forth, the little piece of cork, uh, the iron ball that it was hitting began to sway just a little bit. And the more that little cork hit it, the more that iron ball, and pretty soon you could go in and you could see those two spherical objects that that were mimicking one another. They were going round and round and round and round and round. Uh, and somebody came in and looked at it and said, well, how was that? He says that that little bit of pressure, that cork ball, exerted on that iron ball, it adds up time after time after time after time. He said, what did you tell us that story for? Because you may not think of yourself as a heavyweight witness for Christ or anybody that can have any influence but even the little bit that you think you do eventually it's going to move that great big iron ball and you're going to have an influence on somebody uh, Timothy was a caring preacher so how do we know this because Timothy didn't run away when people had problems. John 10, verse 12, Jesus said this, He that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own sheep are not, seeing the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep, the hireling fleeth, because he is an hireling, and cares not for the sheep. Well, Timothy was no hireling. He did not run when the wolf came along. He stayed. He stayed. And that's why Paul sent him. So he was Paul's communicator. He was a caring preacher. And he was a constant servant, constant son. Now we don't use the word constant very much. But when something's constant, it means 
It's going to be there and be there and be there and be there and be there. You can count on it. And that was Timothy. The word servant in the Bible is found 491 times. The word servant is found 480 times. That means servants in the Bible is mentioned almost a thousand times in the Bible one way or another. That's a lot of times for a word in the Bible. And Timothy had the privilege of being called a servant. And a son. Now, this was high praise from Paul. Why? Because Paul described himself in this exact same way. Titus 1 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Romans 1 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. I won't go further. There's a couple more in there. So, so when Paul said, Timothy is my son and my, your servant and my servant. That was a high compliment. You couldn't say anything better as far as Paul was concerned. Um, you know what that means, don't you? That if you're a servant and I'm a servant and we're all servants, who's the master? It ain't me. It's Jesus Christ our Lord. He's the master. And it's good to have one master. That means when uh, we have a disagreement, we have somebody to go to. Say, Lord, clear this up. 1 Corinthians 7.22 uh, says, He that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's freeman. Likewise, also, he that is called being free is Christ's servant. So we're Christ's servant, yet Christ has made us free. It's kind of a... And you say that's kind of a weird, it's called the paradox. It's one of those paradoxes in scriptures. I'm going to preach on this sometime. Some of the paradoxes in scriptures. I've, 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 I've got a couple sermons like that that I've preached before that are paradox. This is one of them. Galatians 1.10 says, I do now persuade men, uh, for, I, uh, for do I now persuade men or God? I'll get it straight. Or do I seek to please man? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Timothy pleased Christ, Paul pleased Christ, and if we please Christ, we're all on the same team. What a blessed thing. And all I got to say, before I get to my conclusion, is Paul must have had a very, uh, Paul, Timothy and Paul must have had a very good life. You say, well, Paul didn't have a very good life. He got thrown to the lions. It doesn't matter how this life begins or ends. What matters is what's afterwards. What's afterwards? But Timothy had a good life when he was here. Uh, I mean, uh, I bet you Timothy liked to travel, so Paul kept him traveling. Timothy liked people. Paul put him around people. So did God. So Paul had a good life. Timothy had a good life. 2 Timothy 2.22 2.25 says, Flee also youthful lust and follow after righteousness, faith, charity, peace for them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart but foolish and unlearned questions. Avoid knowing that they do gender strife. And the servant of the Lord must not strive but be gentle unto all men have to teach patient in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth it's so good when you get up in the pulpit and people respond to the message of the Lord uh, I used to give a lot of invitations I don't much anymore people don't know what to do with invitations anymore um, I don't really know why I've, I've pondered this question but um, I know that I know that we need to humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God a lady named uh, well, I think this is the man Angelo I guess is the man's name isn't it yeah. Angelo uh, Patry tells of a childhood inter, uh, 
incident in school. The alarm bell sounded, which meant a fire drill. I don't know if they still have those or not. They should. And the nearest door he went through quickly and was soon out in the yard. The next day, the principal sent for him, and when he was seated in the office, there came a sudden question. Were you near the big door yesterday when the alarm bell rang? Uh, he said, yes. He said, why didn't you hold the door open for the other people? Well, the young man gulped and explained that he was going on an errand, and besides, Tim was the monitor of the door, not him. And the principal said something Paul, uh, Petri never forgot. He said, you know the door was to be held open, and you were there. Next time, serve where you are. Well, that's good preaching, isn't it? That's good preaching. Serve where you are. Timothy did that. No matter where God and Paul sent him, he, he tried to do something. Now, like I said, this is really about Timothy the person. Um, I'm going to get eventually <coughs> get around to the book of First and Second Timothy, and I will go into uh, Timothy in depth at those times. Uh, but in conclusion, I want to say that Timothy was such a nice uh, guy. Paul loved him like he was his own son. And it's nice to have somebody love you like they're part of your family. Uh, Y'all have done that with me around here, and I appreciate it. Um, it it's a great thing. And uh, this year it's been especially nice. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 1 chapter 1 verse 2 I keep getting my numbers mixed up don't I? It says to Timothy my dearly beloved son grace mercy and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord Paul called Timothy his son <coughs> Paul wasn't even married <coughs> he didn't have any children but this guy came along and he trained him, and they went on the road together, and they served together. And I understand that. Uh, when Brother Bill died, it, it hit me hard. Because, um, now, me and my dad had gotten reconciled many years ago after he got saved. But because of things in the family with my mother, uh, who didn't want me to be down in Bible school and she didn't want me living in Pensacola, um, she gave him a hard time about fellowshipping with uh, his own son. So Brother Bill became my surrogate father, and he was. Whenever I had a problem, I didn't call Dad. I went to Brother Bill and talked to him. Um, whenever I had some kind of conundrum, that I couldn't figure out, I would go to Brother Bill, and we figure it out. And when he died, it was like to lose it. And, and I tell you the truth, um, his own children, uh, when they came down uh, to his funeral, uh, they didn't know quite how to take me uh, because I was as close to their father as some of them were, maybe even closer. And they didn't know what to do with that. And I got, I, looking back at it now, I thought, I, I, I think, well, that must have been kind of tough on them. Because here's somebody that's not really part of your family, that's insinuated himself in your family, and now he's a little closer than you are to your family. But you know what? That's the way Christians get. And we are family around here. And what we need is to enlarge the family. Amen? Uh, there's people out there that, that need us. They do. They need you. They need me. Um, you say, well, I'm not much of a, a part. But they need you. They need you. You're the exact kind of wrench that nut needs. Mm -hmm. And God will put you with the right people. Our job is to go out there and find those people. And when we get to heaven... We'll be standing in a long line. At the front of that line will be Paul and Timothy. 
when they're passing out stuff. And I and, and you say, well, won't God run out by the time you get? No, God never runs out of stuff. He got plenty of stuff to give everybody. Amen? So, as you go home this week, and you go to work, and you do the things you're doing, be on the lookout. Try to spot that person that needs somebody. Because uh, I'm not going to be there. And some of the other people in this building aren't going to be there. But you're going to be there. And so that, chances are, you're the person God wants to talk to that other person. So be there for God. And, and try to do something for the Lord this week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, <coughs> Lord, I pray you help us as we go home. Lord, thank you for Timothy. And Lord, thank you for uh, the Apostle Paul. Most of all, thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. God, he's been my friend for a long time. And God, there's been times when I've been out on the road and I didn't have nobody. Uh, it cost a lot of money to, to call long distance back to Pensacola. And so I tried to keep uh, those kind of short. Which meant I sat a lot of places, uh, you know, the, the, whoever pastor I was preaching for, he had his family and his problems to deal with. And so I was alone, but I had you, God. And so many times you came to me and fellowship with me, and it was a great thing. And I thank you for that, Lord. And God, I learned through that experience that, God, you really do care for us. And you love us. And God, uh, you died for the people outside these walls. And you want to see them in heaven just as much as you want to see us in heaven. But they got to come to you, God, so that you can save them. So, Lord, send us somebody, Lord, that we can tell a good story to. And maybe they'll be a Timothy. Maybe we can be their Paul, God. Help us, Lord. Give us those people that we need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.